All right. Good morning, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. Thanks uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we are very excited to have Jerry Wetzel and Jessica Zaucha, Zaucha join us uh, for this presentation. My name is Dana Slowinski, and I am co-owner of Family Recovery Centers. And I wanted to take just a minute to share a little bit about Family Recovery Centers for those of you that are not familiar. We are an intensive outpatient program for adolescents and their parents. We have locations in Lake Bluff, Hoffman Estates, St. Charles, and we're opening a fourth location this fall. So details to come on that. We work with a wide range of adolescents uh, struggling with <clears throat> mood disorders, um, maladaptive behaviors, substance use, self-injury. And two program highlights that I like to discuss are parent involvement. So our parents are on site with their kiddos two of the four evenings. So they're not only learning the skills right along with their kids, but they're also doing their own work so that we can really focus on the whole family system. Um, and then we also have a 24-7 um, on-call system. So both parents and kids can uh, reach out and be connected to a therapist that they're working with in the program um, for in vivo in their own life skills coaching so that it's not just treatment when they're with us, but really in their own environment, we can make, we can make that change as well. Um, so that is us in a very quick nutshell. If you have questions about Family Recovery Centers, please feel free to reach out to myself or Ryan, and we would be happy to talk further with you. Um, we love, love doing these webinars and partnering with um, other community resources. And BZA is, uh, we are very grateful for BZA and our collaboration and um, relationship with them. They have been, they're wonderful staple in um, multiple communities that we are also in. So with that, I will turn it over to Jessica to introduce them further. I'll unmute, unmute first. Thank you guys for uh, coming today and, and joining us on a, on a drizzly Wednesday morning. Um, uh, and thanks, Diane, for the, or Dana, for the lovely introduction. Um, you know, we have, uh, this is a, a, a couple of collaborations now with FRC and uh, we, you know, can't uh, thank you guys enough for, um, for, for letting us join you and for everything you guys do for the community. Um, you know, uh, we can't say enough about the treatment you provide, but also this wonderful opportunity to collaborate. Um, you guys are truly leaders in, 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 in collaboration in, in our community and uh, it's a great opportunity for clinicians to come together uh, to, to put our minds together, to really kind of think about some of these topics, um, hopefully in different ways than we, than we do every day. And that's, uh, that's really why we're here today. I think we, we recognize the, uh, the, the experience and the talent of, of so many of you who, uh, who join us and want to think about how we're treating our, our families and our, our adolescents and our adults. Um, but, uh, you know, we also recognize that this last couple of years in particular has brought on some shifts in our in our models of treatment and and how we can uh, and 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 has challenged us as clinicians to think differently about how we support families. Um, and resilience is a word that comes up a lot. Uh, it is something that I have found myself using differently as as a therapist. Um, and so that's really what we're here to do today is to talk a little bit about resilience, to talk about challenging times and how it how it changes the dynamic of what we do. Um, but again, just wanted to give a little bit about BZA Behavioral Health and what, what we do. Um, we are a uh, group of uh, behavioral health practice in we have two locations, one uh, in Northwest Schaumburg, uh, almost by Harper College, and then the other in Lake in the Hills. We are providers of individual therapy, uh, family therapy, couples treatment groups. Um, we have a very active DBT group running out of the Lake in the Hills office. Uh, which I know partners a lot with uh, with Dana, so I wanted to highlight that with with, uh, with FRC. So I wanted to highlight that program. Um, we also provide uh, psychiatry and psychological testing, um, in addition to a spectrum of other services. So, uh, you know, by all means, we have some uh, some opportunity here to check out our website to see what else we offer. Um, but uh, but that's kind of BZA in a nutshell. So. Um, it is my privilege today to kind of co-host with my, uh, with one of our, uh, with one of our providers, Jerry Wetzel, who is, uh, she, she loves to be kind of considered the resident grief expert here at BZA and in the community. <laughs> we were kind of talking on Monday night about how that, that title comes with both um, privilege as well as, uh, you know, it can be a heavy title to carry, but she does a lot of that work. And so, uh, so I'll be introducing her in just a moment. But again, just to kind of ground us around the topic. Um, you know, when we think a little bit about um, about 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 therapy and about treating families, Jerry, if you want to advance to the next slide, 
um, when we think about uh, working with families, you know, this this uh, this picture came to me, I think, pretty early in the in the pandemic, um, as uh, and something that kind of made me chuckle. But it's this idea of feeling kind of helpless during really challenging times. So this meme kind of highlights the sinking of the Titanic and the scene from that that movie that we know actually did happen, where a group of musicians, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, you know allowed for people to essentially meet their doom in a peaceful way, a uh, more peaceful way by playing music, and so. Uh, kind of the meme here is identifying that this is therapist teaching mindfulness skills over Zoom while the Titanic is going down. And, and kind of just to me, emphasize sometimes the feeling of helplessness when we are uh, working with families that are facing really troubled waters. Certainly in this case, these are very troubled waters. Um, and how do, we, how do we change our approach so that we can feel that, you know, I mean, on one hand, these, these musicians actually played a really important role in allowing some people to actually survive this tragedy by keeping them calm and by, you know, offering some safety within a very chaotic environment. So in some ways, you know, there is a lot of benefit in teaching mindfulness over Zoom during, uh, you know, during really hard times. Um, and at the same time, I think we want to, you know, buff our other skills to make sure that we are offering, um, offering the families we work with, you know, some different perspectives and that we feel equipped to do everything we can uh, to walk families through their hard times. Um, so that's so that's kind of why I chose this, this, uh, this slide to start us off here. But moving on to kind of some of our objectives today, you know, our hope is that when y'all leave today, you'll be able to better recognize and identify some of the ways in which our youth and families experience stress, grief, trauma, and life challenges in general. Um, we hope that uh, you'll be able to consider the impact of grief, trauma, and uh, look at my slides here, and chronic stress on individual and family systems and we'll develop effective family engagement skills um, that you'll learn some strategies. I, you know, no one wants to come and spend two hours sitting through a presentation and not walk away with some hands-on strategies. So we really hope to give you some tools today to enhance not only family connectedness, um, you know, communication skills, uh, ability to identify emotions, but also positive parenting interventions um, and some resilience building skills um, through through skills like learning, modeling, problem solving, coping, self-care, validation, and acknowledgement. Um, so before I introduce Jerry, you know, just want to kind of share a little bit about how today's presentation hopefully will go. Uh, Jerry and I are kind of going to co-present. She's going to take the first half, which really we're going to dive into the subject of grief. Um, and the reason why we wanted to start with that is because to come to a presentation on resilience and not to pause to speak to the challenge part of our presentation. You know, these are, we're talking about building resilience during challenging times. And challenging times both creates the platform for resilience to build. We know that we don't, we don't get stronger in, in, in uh, you know, in, in times when things are calm. Like these are the opportunities we have to build resilience and to become stronger. It also creates, uh, you know, an environment that, you know, that, that challenges us as therapists, as providers, as caretakers to kind of shift our, our modalities. So, um, so the challenging time piece is really what I kind of want to frame us around. And, and Jerry is going to speak to grief in a much broader term than just loss of a loved one, you know, uh, in the way of death, but also how, you know, how, 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 how many things actually fit under the umbrella of grief. Um, so she's going to present a little bit about grief and then hand controls over to me for the second half where we're going to dive more into uh, resilience um, and hopefully thread those two topics together for you in a way that makes sense. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A or the chat um, rather than like a hand raise for a question. Um, I will be helping each other out. So I will try to respond to those questions timely, um, even if it's just to let you know that it's something we're going to get to. We will pause for questions um, both in the middle of the presentation and at the end. Um, so uh, if we are deferring any questions, we'll make sure we come back to them at that point. So please feel free to ask questions as they come up and we will hold them for you. Um, and I think that's my housekeeping stuff. So um, without further ado, I'm introducing Jerry Wetzel, who is, again, one of our esteemed providers at BZA Behavioral Health, uh, you know, a bit of a resident grief expert. Uh, she does grief uh, presentations, grief groups. Um, when someone is uh, contacting us looking for grief counseling, she's typically the first person we go to. So it is uh, an honor to introduce her and to co-present with her today. So, Jerry, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so in 2007, I lost my husband to a sudden heart thing and I was already doing therapy. So we, uh, obviously we switched automatically to grief therapy and 
it really helped me. It was something that I learned. It helped me grow. It helped me um, get through the grief to develop resilience. And because of my therapist um, helping me in that manner is why I decided to become a therapist and share my knowledge, share my pain, share all my good stuff with others to help them through what can be a very bad time. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about things that we need to know about grief. We think we know, but maybe we don't know, um, you know what it is, um, what we grieve. It is more than a person. It's uh, how we respond, the process of grief. Of course, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about how to help families, how children react to grief, helping children to cope and grow with the grief and helping families cope and learn to be resilient. Okay, um, so especially since the pandemic, there have been a lot of other losses that people aren't, don't always think of as grief. I had a client come in and she originally came in because her mother was dying and did, and did die um, during our sessions or not during our sessions, but while we were working together, um, she felt better. We, we terminated the um, therapy and she was starting to get move on and stuff. And then she contacted me to start again because she had decided it was time to get divorced. It really, the marriage was over. She knew it was the absolute right thing to do. It was going to be best for her, her husband and her kids, but she still felt this loss. She still felt very sad about it. And what she didn't realize is she needed to grieve that marriage she needed to grieve um the loss of that family now she still had a family with her children but she the the unit the original unit family was gone and realizing that really was like a light bulb moment for her to realize she did need to go through that stuff and it's okay as much as she thought the divorce was the best thing to do it was still okay to be sad about it it was still okay to grieve about that so we do grieve about a lot of things other than a person, you know, um, loss of independence and freedom. Um, the kids really, some of the kids really were upset about the loss of um, celebration, graduations, proms, wedding, funerals. Um, that's one thing I've observed working with my clients is that the changing of how we are able to do the, the rites and rituals after somebody has passed, whether it was from COVID or something else, really um, affected how they grieve. Some people report it like it really kind of like put it off. It was harder to um, process some of the grief because they didn't get to have some of the rituals that we associate with grief and mourning somebody who has passed. Okay, so what is grief? Grief is a normal response to loss. It's typical, we need to do it. Grief is actually what's on the inside. So that's the hurt and the pain and all that stuff. And mourning is what's happening on the outside. So that's um, the rituals. It's, um, you know, doing certain tasks and things that help us get past um, the grief. And this is the hardest thing that people um, have is when I tell them grief has no timeline. We're always going, well, when will it be over? I want it over. When will it be over? How long will this last? There is no timeline. It depends on a great many things. Um, and it, the person, what happened, there are so many things that can factor in how long somebody grieves and they just want to be normal again. And that's really hard to accept sometimes. So grief is a process, not an event. So it's sort of like back to there's no timeline. It's not like you wake up after somebody's loss or there's a big loss and you just suddenly go, okay, I'm over it. It happens over time. Every day you feel a little bit better until you realize, wow, I'm a lot better. It's not as painful as it was when it first happened. This is real important for families to be aware of. The different, it's different for any, everyone. And I am going to discuss it a little bit more later on. But grief is different for everyone, every person. Um, I like to use this example of when I have two sisters. When our mom died, we all grieved differently. Not because one of us was closer to mom, not because one of us loved mom more. We are a very tight-knit family. Everybody was suffering. But we are 
three different women who handle things three different ways. So our grief for our mom was different. Didn't mean anybody was less or more, just different. And that can be hard for people to accept sometimes. Why aren't you as sad as I am? Grief is something that needs to be witnessed. It needs to be talked about. Um, the, usually the first time somebody comes in, they just start telling me everything. They want to talk about it all again. Uh, even if I say, if it hurts too much, you don't have to. And they start um, spilling in their guts about what happened and how it is. It's, it's like even with a divorce or the loss of things that they that are more abstract, like loss of um, independence. How did I lose my independence? These, these, these things led up to the loss of my independence. They need to be able to talk about this stuff. And within families, they need to be able to talk about it with each other. They can't just be alone with their grief. You know, they need to discuss whatever happened, whoever is gone. Grief is also something not to be judged. Um, I find that the people who are most judgmental about grief are the ones who have never really had serious grief. They don't get it. They think they know how they would react if um, they lost somebody or if whatever incident happened. Oh, you know, I wouldn't be that upset if I missed prom. We don't, but we can't judge why somebody is so upset and what is going on with them. Okay, so let's talk about, these are popular, the stages of grief. And as you can see, those stages of grief on the left are what everybody wants to go through. They just want it to be a nice little linear thing that they do. And actually it is way more like the one on the right where you're here, you're there, it becomes a big tangle of things. Um, even Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book on um, the five stages of grief, one of the first things she says is grief is not linear. Even though she's put out stages, she says it's not linear you can go back and forth between stages depending on what's going on. People prepare for those big days. Okay, an anniversary or something's coming up and I'm prepared for that. And they, they think about it and they think about it and they're prepared. And then usually they tell me, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought because they were prepared. But it's the little things that can help have, send somebody back a little bit or put them back to maybe a different stage. And, you know, I had a client that her husband had passed over a year previously, and then she got something from the DMV that he needed to renew his license. And that just really struck her. And she had a meltdown and we talked about it. And she just had this moment of, you know, bringing it all back. But she was also able then to move forward again and to keep going. Okay. So what is normal responses to grief? What is normal? Normal is the average, the standard, or the healthy behavioral response. When discussing behavior normal, when discussing, excuse me, I'm sorry, when discussing behavior, normal is behavior that is accepted as the norm or the typical. It's particularly used to indicate someone is mentally healthy and does not have psychological problems. So if you're having normal grief, responses that does not mean um you're not normal it's just normal to feel this way you know grief responses um grief can be very powerful and overwhelming no matter what it is you can you can really um sink down into some pretty pretty low places um you know somebody who has retired or has lost um some of their mobility and suddenly they're very depressed because they can't get up and do what they want to anymore. They're grieving the loss of the, what their body used to be able to do. Um, people are unsure and they're afraid and they're afraid of what's happening. They perhaps have never felt these things before. Or again, going back to, it's not something that people typically grieve. So, or they don't think of as grief. And so they're confused on why they feel sad, why they have this tightness in their chest. It, 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 because they think that you can only grieve people. Um, two of the most common questions I get are, are they doing it right? And are they going crazy? I always tell them there is no right or wrong way to grieve. So I can't tell them they're doing it right. You're doing it right for yourself, not what everybody else says. And are they going crazy? I tell them, I, I used to work in the psych hospital. They're nowhere near crazy. Um, I try to lighten it with some, some humor sometimes. It really helps them. Um, because they've never experienced it. So they're, 
they're confused about what it is. Um, some of the physical sensations are the tightness in the throat, heaviness in the chest, empty feelings in the stomach, lack of appetite. All these things here listed are things that can happen when you're responding to grief. And sometimes it's the exact opposite. So some people have a lack of appetite. Some people, um, you know, start eating too much. Some people have a lack of energy. Some people start going into overdrive and start doing everything inside as a way to keep busy, as a way not to think about it. So there are a lot of different things. Um, some people have difficulty sleeping. I had one client said, oh yeah, I go to sleep really well. It's waking up that's hard. It's waking up and realizing all over again that um, he is gone. Okay, so there are thought patterns too. Um, difficulty believing the loss is real. Uh, the I'm not really talking about it, but I'm sure everybody hears that the first stage of grief is denial. My client said, I can't deny my mom is, is gone. I know she died, but it's disbelief. I can't believe she's really gone. I can't believe she's not here anymore. It becomes very surreal. You can't deny it. Um, I always think of the people who lost their loved ones in 9-11 um, or other things like that where bodies not recovered and that getting to that belief that somebody is really long gone has to be exceptionally difficult when you don't have the body to view that's important people don't realize how important it is to view the body after somebody has been gone um an inability to concentrate that is one that i hear i can't read anymore um i'm difficulty getting some work done because i'm having difficulty at work because i can't get things done that is again just telling people to give themselves time they will they will come back from this um they have a preoccupation with the deceased so it's thinking about them maybe putting up pictures or um little displays memorials because they're they're always in their thoughts or maybe not that they weren't, weren't thinking about it before but not this constant all the time all the time thought um difficulty with decision making maybe you know uh a woman who has lost her long-term husband has never really made big decisions by herself. They've always done it as a partner. And so it can be difficult for them to decide what to do next. Or you've retired and you you suddenly realize you're grieving the fact that you are no longer working, which a lot of people um, tie their identity and their purpose up with their job. And you can't make a decision on what to do next. Um, you can't decide if you want to go travel, if you want to have hobbies, what you want to do because you've fallen into this grief state. Um, loss of time perception. I think this is one thing that hit almost everybody big um, during the pandemic when suddenly most of us were staying at home um, and our kids were there and there wasn't the usual routines and we just didn't, I know there were times I'm like, okay, could somebody please tell me what day it is and, and how, you know, what the date is because every day just kind of ran into another. And this can become with grief too, you that you've just you've gone into overdrive. You're just moving through it. You're moving through it to get to a spot where you feel better. Um, confusion, because you don't, a lot of times you still don't know what's going on or you're like, oh, when I go, when we go do this and then you realize you can't go do that because you know, whatever reason it is, I can't, I can't tell so-and-so at work about this um, fun thing I did on the weekend because you're no longer working with so-and-so, you're now retired and they're at the job. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that was my bad. I got myself confused. Um, so the behaviors we have are wandering aimlessly, looking for the loved one. Again, not knowing what you're doing, um, wandering aimlessly, if you, you know, experienced, you know, you're experiencing a divorce and you're moving into a new place and you're not sure what's going on, um, withdrawing from others. You know, uh, a kid who's had to move high schools or any school, that's a really tough, high school especially, is a really tough time for kids to move and they start withdrawing because maybe their friends are all, you know, they can't see their friends anymore. So they start withdraw withdrawing from their families too or increased dependence. A younger child might become more dependent on their 
parent because they need it more for their social outlet because they're not playing with the friends at school because they don't have any friends yet. Um, assuming mannerisms or traits of the, the loved one. That's a little bit of um, a little bit more of an extreme one, but it is a normal response. It is not anything to be concerned about because people are just trying to feel that loved one again and feel like how they acted or what they said. But let's talk about when to worry. Okay, when does it become complicated grief? When do we really need to start worrying? All right, so according to the Mayo Clinic, complicated grief is like being in an ongoing heightened state of mourning that keeps you from healing. Some of the symptoms of complicated grief include persistent acute grief in experienced, um, of, ex is experienced, although loss was over six months ago. Symptoms are persistent for a month or more and cause significant level of interference. So that is, you know, are they getting in the way of somebody's activities for daily living? I had a client, she, she lost her son. Yeah, obviously that was very devastating. She took time off of work. She took a couple, three months off of work, but she kept functioning. She kept getting up, she kept getting dressed, she kept getting um, eating, taking care of her hygiene, all those things that are activities of daily living. If she was just living in, uh, staying in bed all day and not doing anything, then I would be very concerned about that and look into perhaps some higher level of care for them. Okay, so complicated grief may include feelings of yearning, loneliness, shock, or anger, difficulty trusting, inability to accept a loved one's death, and preoccup preoccupying thoughts of the loved one. So it is just, it just keeps going. It's not getting better. You know, after a month, you should start feeling some relief. Um, an individual struggling with complex grief may avoid reminders of loved ones, have sleep or appetite problems, and has the potential for self-destructive behaviors. So avoiding reminders might say, you know what? I can't go anywhere. I have a client that tells me every time she goes out in her neighborhood, she's reminded of the places she was with her loved one and it hurts. And she's, you know, she's not in complicated grief yet, but that is definitely something that if she avoided it so much, she was staying at home all the time, that would be very concerning. Obviously potential for self-destructive behaviors, um, self-harm and things of that nature, um, not eating correctly, um, doing um, risky behaviors. This is something perhaps you need to especially keep an eye out for with kids because they have a habit of doing that. All right, so let's talk about the kids, their behaviors and what they know, what they understand and how uh, grief affects them and how we can help them through grief. Um, many of the things that I'm gonna talk about with the different age groups, Jess is gonna cover again, um, in, in a slightly different way. She's gonna bring up resilience more, but some of the things are very similar. So it's worth repeating. It's worth saying again, what these things are because how you can help somebody with grief is how you can help them become more resilient. So obviously somebody who is a newborn to two years old really does not understand the losing of something, the losing of grief. You know, they're typically, they don't see it for 30 seconds. They're onto something else. They're not, they're, they're like, okay, whatever, you know, they cry for 30 seconds after mom leaves the room and then they're playing again. So they really don't get loss, but they do respond to it. They do respond to the grief of the parents or the caregivers. Um, you know, there's been some evidence that kids are responding to stress in utero and how it affects them. So if a baby in utero can be affected by the mom, then obviously a newborn could, they might become more irritable. They might protest, fussy, um, constant crying, difficult to um, soothe them. Disruption in sleeping and eating habits. So you've gotten the kid to the point where, you know, they're eating the three regular meals and stuff and going to bed at a certain time. And then suddenly they're not anymore. That can happen with your little ones. Some of the things you can do to help with that is to keep to the usual schedule as much as possible. So, you know, if your kid, gets up at 
uh, seven and then they eat breakfast and then around noon they're having lunch, then a nap, then dinner at bedtime. As much as possible, try to stick to that schedule. That will help them with the routines. Routines are very helpful for everyone, not just um, little ones. It's best if possible too, if you can keep the child in their own home. That way it's familiar to them. They don't quite understand new places can be a little overwhelming for, for the young ones. And having the comfort of their own bed and their own house and knowing where things are, it can be very good. Um, try to keep as few caregivers as possible. That again can be difficult depending on what's going on. If there's a lot of commotion, um, depends on how many members of the usual caregivers are involved with what's going on. That can um, affect who else you might have to ask. It's important to try to um, make sure their care, that the caregivers are people the child knows and is familiar with. So you want to make sure that they know for their own comfort. When my niece had her daughter and she was in the ICU for months, she was uh, pre premature by a month, we, we passed her older brother around while the parents were trying to take care of everything. And we got to a point where we were like almost stuck and who could watch Alex. And I was going to ask my best friend, but we were hesitant. He doesn't know her. Not that we don't trust her. He didn't know her. And he was only two. We couldn't explain things to him. So it's good if you can not to, to always try to have somebody familiar to the child. And of course, extra cuddles, extra hugs. Kids need that, we all need that. And sometimes giving those extra cuddles and hugs can help us as much as it's helping the baby. Um, preschoolers, what do they understand? Well, they have a vague understanding of what's going on. They know something has changed. They know somebody is gone. They know some differences. Um, you know, at the start of the pandemic, if mommy lost her job, they probably understand, oh, mommy's home more often. I'm not going to daycare. Um, where did grandma go? How come grandma's not coming over to see us? Why are we in a different house? They do understand things are different and they, they can get some of that. Um, with death, they may think the person is asleep and the person will wake up. This is kind of common for kids, especially once they've seen like at a funeral where they see somebody just laying there with their eyes closed. To them, that is sleepy. You know, they come into mom's room and she's laying in bed with her eyes closed, she's sleepy. They deny death is final because they haven't got it yet to understand that somebody, what death really means, that death is it, that we're not gonna see that person anymore. So they'll tell you, oh no, oh no, grandma's not dead. Grandma's not dead. Um, magical thinking. Grandma will come back. When's grandma coming back? So these are all some of the things that preschoolers, how they understand and don't understand um, death. Of course, their behaviors are some regression. So that might be um, starting to suck their thumb again, maybe some potty accidents, things of that nature. Um, they might have repeated questions about the person who passed. Again, where is grandma? When's grandma coming back? Is grandma at home? Um, you've moved houses. How come we're in this house? When can we go back to our other house? I like our other house better. Why are we in this house? We've all been at that end of a little one with a bunch of questions. They're, fear they're very fe fearful of being separated from their parents. Um, okay, so grandma left. Mommy and daddy, are you leaving? Um, especially if, unfortunately, it is one of the parents who are gone then they become even more anxious about being separated from the parent that is there. So it's very, they have anxiety, separation anxiety, um, things of that nature. Preschoolers thinking is very literal. So if you tell somebody, if you tell a three-year-old, oh, they're just sleeping, they're gonna believe you. They're gonna think, okay, I'm gonna go there and shake her and she's gonna wake up. Um, they will go look for the lost person. So if you said, oh, we lost grandma, they're gonna go, okay, let's go find her because they don't understand the euphemisms that we, we use. They don't have that language yet. Again, keep routines as much as possible, especially at the beginning and the end of the day. 
if even if you can't be in the child's home, you can still do the routines that you do in the morning. We get up, we brush our teeth, we have our breakfast. At the end of the day, we get in our pajamas, maybe take our bath, brush our teeth. If it's if you it's a usual story time, do the usual story time and keep that routine going for the kids. And actually keeping routines is helpful to the adults too. I know at the beginning of the pandemic, it was great. We kind of like, oh, yay, everybody's not off of school. And we were trying to, we were being very flexible. And then suddenly we realized this is long-term and we had to get back to the routines. It's important kids like the routines. Um, short, honest explanations, keep it simple. So if a child says, mommy, why did we have to move houses? Of course, you don't want to go into a long explanation about mortgages and not being able to pay and, you know, having to move, but it could be a short, honest answer is that we, we couldn't afford the big house. We decided we were going to move to a smaller house. We like the smaller house better. That's enough for them. We like this better. Again, avoid euphemisms. Um, you know, she's gone to a better place. Well, what's that better place? Can I go there? I want to see grandma. Can we, can we Skype her there? Kids are getting very savvy about some of those things. Be flexible when needed. Again, we'll go back to the routines, but if it's the, if it's a time, it's the usual bedtime, but there's a lot of people there. The, the child is engaged maybe with some other young people. Maybe you give them a little bit more time. You can be flexible about routines. We still need the flexibility ourselves. Okay, so it's also a good time again to have extra hugs and extra reassurances. Honey, let's give a hug. Mommy and daddy are gonna be here. Mommy and daddy or mommy or daddy, whoever it is, is going to stay with you. There will always be somebody who will take care of you. We will stay in this house for a while. Be honest. Yeah, we grandma died and she's not coming back, but we still love her and she will always be part of our family. Let them know they have support more than their mom or dad, um, especially if they see mom and dad upset. Kids are notorious for not wanting to upset them more so they don't talk about things. So that's maybe when you um, get a friend to come be with them or ha let them go play at a friend's house. And maybe it's a mom they're very familiar with and they can help them through this. Or if it's an aunt or an uncle appropriately, depending on how, what the grief is about and how it's affecting them, giving them somebody else that can give them the extra hugs and just sit there and be with them and let them know that they are being cared for. Okay, so more on how to, um, help preschoolers, I'm sorry, be patient. More questions over and over and over again. Again, that's typical preschool behavior, the old why, why, why isn't grandma coming back? Why did she leave? Why, why, why? And it's okay to be patient or please be patient with them. It's okay to let them know that it's okay to cry. Sometimes they're gonna be sad and they're gonna be crying. And a few minutes later, they're gonna be out playing jump rope with their friend. And then they might come back and realize all over again the bad thing. And then they're going to go out and play again. This is, you know, this is how kids' minds work. They can be very good about, okay, I'm just going to go play now. Well, you know what? I'm sad again. Or they come in and realize all over again, grandma is gone. Make sure they understand they're not the cause of the death, right? That, oh, I yelled at grandma and that's why she died. I, um, I'm sorry, I was, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. H have them involved with the funeral planning, okay? So, you know, prepare them for the funeral. So tell them, this is what's gonna happen. Would you like to say anything? Um, what song do you think grandma would like us to play? Prepare them for the funeral. And especially young kids have never been to a funeral um, sometimes even older kids have never had, I guess, the chance to go to a funeral. And so it's time to prepare them. Okay, so it's in a nice place with lots of chairs. Grandma's going to be there. She's going to be laying down with her eyes closed, but she's not sleeping. She is dead. 
she is um, going to be very still, of course. And if you touch her, she's, she's not going to feel the same anymore. She's going to feel a little cold, a little hard. Let them know what's going on so that they're prepared. They're not going to walk in and just be shocked by what they're seeing. Um, kids just need to know. Everybody wants to know what, what they're prepared for. Okay, so let's talk about Jerry. Kids. Jerry, just yeah. to just to jump in here real quick, because I I think obviously you know it, you know when and when we broaden grief beyond you know death and dying, you know I think some of these same principles are really true when it comes to. Uh, you know, to the, the, the concreteness and preparedness of something like a move or like, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a big shift in, in, in lifestyle outside, you know, so I think I think the, the take home message is to, you know, I, rather than sheltering our kids from from some of that information that it's really good to kind of help them to feel prepared that, you know, that might be the instinct of a parent is to try to kind of keep things at, at, at you know, at bay, but but really kind of that exposure is really helpful. Am I hearing that correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, so your your six to nine year olds, they're starting to understand a little bit better. They still kind of think death is reversible, but they're not so sure yet. Maybe they've had some experience with it previously, maybe a pet, maybe um, another person. Kids feel responsible, right? They feel re they still feel responsible. Mommy lost her job because she had to take a day off because I was sick. So they get it in their head that that's why mommy lost her job and that's why mommy is sad. Um, they caused the death. I yelled at her um, and I was mad and it, I wished she had died. Kids might think things, sad things are contagious. Um, Susie's family lost their house. She told me they lost the house and they had to move away. Are we going to lose our house? Well, we have to move away. So again, it's like, like Jess said, preparing the kids, letting them know that, you know, Susie, Susie's, unfortunately, Susie's family did lose their house, but mom and dad still have their job and we're still planning on staying here and reassuring them that in, in very concrete terms, not just, oh, everything's okay, just sit down and really explain it to them on why it's okay. Mommy and daddy still have their jobs. Susie, daddy lost his job and they didn't have enough money for the house. Um, so how do six to nine year olds behave? Well, again, some of their sleeping and eating habits can change. They're worried about safety and abandonment. Will I be safe in a new house? We're moving to a different state. Is that a safe state? Um, and will mommy and daddy leave me? You have to keep reassuring them that things are gonna be okay. Uh, are there highs and there are gonna be highs and lows, kind of like going out to play and coming in and crying, going out to play, coming in and crying. They might have nightmares about trying to find the house or grandma, where's grandma? Again, they might have some regressive behaviors, um, start sucking their thumb again, um, maybe even baby talk, acting like a little one. They want, maybe they want that attention. Uh, physical complaints. A kid can't tell you that their chest is tight and their heart hurts because of grief, but they might tell you, I have a headache or I have a tummy ache because they don't have the words yet to talk about these things. Um, ask what they know, how to help them, ask what they know. So they might tell you, well, I know we have to move to a new house and that um, I got I have to go to a new school. Okay, yes, we're gonna move to a new house because we need a smaller house. Be honest. Um, as much as honesty as you think the child can handle, you know, kids are gonna find out the lights. They're gonna overhear. So they're going to know what's up. And I think if they find out you've been lying to them, a parent's been lying to them, they lose a lot of trust. Talk about some concrete words. Using concrete words, I'm sorry. Grandma died. Dad lost his job. We're moving. Let them know what is up. Explain the feelings. At this age, and even as adults, we don't always understand what we're feeling in the moment. 
help them understand what they're feeling. You're sad because we're leaving your friends behind. You're sad because um, grandma is not with us anymore. You're angry. You're angry at mommy and daddy because they're making you move. That's okay. Let them know their feelings are okay. Let them know that it is okay to have feelings and how can you express those feelings? Um, let them know they didn't cause the death or whatever's going on. No, honey, taking one day off of work isn't why I lost my job. I lost my job because, because of the pandemic, nobody was coming into our restaurant and the owner couldn't pay me without people coming in. Um, talk about their fears. Losing others, what will happen to me? Kids are big about what will happen to me. If we lose the new house, what will happen to me? They're very, you know, centered on themselves, not on the whole family. Um, involved in the planning. These kids are definitely old enough to do that. Let's, let's go look at houses together. Can you pick out your own bedroom? Can you um, see where your toys are going to go? Where would you like your toys to go? Help us pack. These All these things help the kids. Kids like to be vested. They like to be in on it. Um, as much as they might complain about actually having to do things like that, they want to be in on it. Um, understand that kids might play the dying. They have to act it out. It's a natural part of being a kid that they're actually acting out. It's harder they understand it. Just let them do it. And, you know, that's why sometimes we end up with fairly elaborate funerals for the goldfish. Okay. Um, Six, allow them to talk about it and ask questions. Give them physical and emotional nurturing. Again, we're talking about hugs and, and extra, um, extra kisses. Validate their feelings. You're feeling sad, you're feeling angry. It is sad that we're moving. Um, I would be mad too. Give them choices. Kids love choices. So again, back to which bedroom would you like to sleep in? Where would you want to go? Um, we can't go to we can't go to Great America this year because of the pandemic. They closed the park. We're someplace around here that we could go. Here's a list of places we could go. Would you like to go in one of those? They have support. They have somebody there to help them. I went to the funeral of a friend's mom and um, obviously, my friend was was crying and upset, and her little girl was crying and upset. Um, but the little girl's paternal grandma took her in her arms and just stood there and rocked her. It was one of the it, actually one of the sweetest things I've ever seen. They just stood there. Grandma didn't say anything. She didn't do anything other than hold their that little girl. That little girl needed the extra support from somebody besides her mom, because at that moment, unfortunately, her mom couldn't give it to her because her mom was trying to get through her own things. So it's good when somebody else can come in when the parents need help, whether it's over death, whether it's over just giving them a chance to complain because things aren't the same like they were. All right, let's talk about tweens. Tweens, they do understand death is permanent. They wanna know how it will affect them. I have a client that lost her husband two years ago, just before the pandemic started to cancer. Just recently, she's been diagnosed with cancer. She has two children, a tween and a high schooler. And so she had to go and talk to her children about having cancer. Obviously, that was a very tough thing. Um, she has told me that her, her son is on the spectrum. So sometimes the way he asks questions or processes things is different. So when she told him she had cancer, he looked at her and goes, well, what's going to happen to me, mom? If you go, and she's like, well, I'm not really planning on going, but you never know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. And if something happens to me, you're gonna go live with your uncle Bill. And he looked at her and said, okay, and left. He just wanted to know how, if, if mom's gone, how will it affect her, him? You know, if we have to move, am I gonna go to a new school? You lost your job. Does that mean I get to have, I still can have um, food? Um, they have some focus on what happens to the body. What happens do, you know, uh, they're starting to understand 
how bodies decompose and move. Um, of course, there's guilt and regret. I should have I should have spent more time with grandma. I should have talked to her more. Why didn't I come to the phone when she called? All those things that a lot of us feel. Um, some of the behaviors can be seen as acting out. They're restless in school. Um, they're not doing their homework. Maybe some of that is due to a lack of concentration, not just being um, naughty. The world is no longer safe. Boy, this is a big one now with tweens and um, teenagers and even some of the younger school age kids because they see it. Almost every week, there's a new school shooting and it's really hard to tell a kid when they come up to you. I had a, a client that said he didn't feel safe at school because of all the school shootings. So we had to talk about what he knew about his school and how they could, how they're working really hard to protect the kids and doing their best to keep everybody safe. I encouraged them to go ask somebody at his school what their, what their plans and policy were. And then he told me, I don't like going shopping with my mom because I'm afraid of shooters. Well, that's a little tougher one to try to um, talk about because I certainly was never gonna go, oh, you're safe, no problem, nothing's gonna happen because we unfortunately see that all the time. So again, we talked about you know being aware what he could do if he heard gunshots, where he could go for safety. We looked up online like tips on what to do if you're in some sort of acting, active shooting incident. I knew there was no world, way I could tell him the world's safe. It just doesn't feel that way anymore. Um, but we did concentrate a lot on focusing on how he could keep himself safe. safe. This to me was grieving and losing his, some of his innocence. And I think a lot of kids are doing that because of what's happening. Um, again, they have problems concentrating and focusing, intrusive thoughts. Will I be the next one to go? What if we lose this house? What if there's a shooter in our school? Bad dreams. They were running. They didn't know what they were running from, but they were running and they were scared. Teens, again, use play. Then tweens, I meant, I'm sorry. They use play. They have questions about death. Um, of course, a wide range of emotions because tweens are right at that age where those emotions go from one second, they're happy to the next second, you're ruining their lives. Um, they have withdrawal from family and friends, maybe want to spend some more time in their room. And again, this can be a tough one to see what's going on because it's a natural thing for tweens to start spending more time in their room away from the family. So it's tough to know, is it due to the grief or is it due to um, and becoming a teenager. Okay, so teens wanna know what happened. Nobody wants to go around not knowing what happened. So whatever it is, whether it's a death, um, a parent losing their job, why did you lose your job? Well, the pandemic closed our store down and I didn't have any place to go work anymore. Clear, accurate answers. It is good to give answers, not just to go, no, that's okay, it's okay avoid euphemisms, you know, oh, she's on to a better place. I know a lot of these things seem to repeat from age to age, and they do, and it's just a matter of um, doing it differently, of course, for their cognitive abilities as the kids are, but they're worth repeating. And these are some of the things Jess is gonna be talking about also. Um, give them a choice of activities. Um, have things around the house for them to do, especially when suddenly they have to stay home a little bit more, they're for whatever reason can't go to school, have things for them to do um, besides their screen time. Okay, people and activities that support them, you know, um, make sure even though it's tough right now, do your best to get them to their sports routine, their sports things, their extracurricular activities. This is the time to maybe ask one of their friends' moms for a little help with this. I'm sure most of them will be understanding. Maintain the routines again. They have to get up, they have to get dressed, they have to brush their teeth, they have to change out of their pajamas. That's fun once in a while, but you can't live in your pajamas like most of us learned during the pandemic. Um, be flexible, stand there and say, okay, today you can stay in your pajamas, but tomorrow you um, need to go 
uh, need to go back to putting on clothes, okay? Um, giving choices. Do you want to go to your sports activities or do you want to stay home? Model expressing emotions. That's how kids learn. Is it just to say, show them how to act. I had a client who told me she couldn't cry in front of anybody. She never saw her parents cry because they were stoic and they didn't, you know, they had to be strong. So now as an adult, she couldn't cry. Um, so let's talk about grieving teens and how to help. This one here is, um, I'm sorry, I skipped a page but a lot of it is the same stuff. They do understand loss is permanent um, and what is actually going on, that it's not necessarily something we can go back to. But the Dougie Center, you see the website there, is a great place for resources on um, helping kids with grief. It's entirely about kids in grief and it's a really well-organized, um, great place to get some information. Um, and they had the kids write up a bill of rights on what they thought was um, what they wanted people to know about grieving teens. Okay, um, they have a right to know the truth about the death. They want their questions answered honestly. They want to be heard and listened to without hearing um, advice. Um, uh, where is the one that I, okay. So they want to see the person who died and maybe the place they want to go. Um, this is one of my favorites is not to have to follow the book, um, to follow the stages of grief as outlined in school health book, assuming someplace kids are learning that in their school health. Um, this is one of my favorites that we use all the time with our grief group is disagree with people who are insensitive, especially when they spout cliches. Kids have a right to Anybody has the right to say, nah, no, 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 I, you know, maybe he's in a better place, but I'm not. Um, so when you're going to help the whole family, it's important to listen, listen, and listen again. A lot of times the first thing my clients do is they come in and they start crying. And all I do is listen to them, listen to them stories, listen to them um, grief, witness their grief, validate, validate, validate again. Um, especially when it's things that as adults we know aren't that big of a deal, but they are to that teenager that you can't be dismissive of them. You can't say, oh, oh crown's not a big deal. Get over it, just get over it. Oh, you don't get to walk across the stage at your graduation. Well, I da 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 da. You know, yeah, people have it worse than that, but the worst is your own grief in that moment. Make sure the parent is caring for themselves, that they are able to take care of their kid because they are, um, caring for themselves. Again, we're going to go to honesty, um, acknowledge the grief. Yeah, you're really sad that um, you couldn't graduate. Uh, use their names, tell stories. Um, again, the rules and boundaries, be reassuring, be patient with you and your child. Ask for help. Help can be a great thing when you ask. People really like to be asked for help. They want to do something for you. So asking for help is good. Um, so just real quick, some final thoughts are, you know, plan ahead for special days. We're in a new house. How do we want to celebrate Thanksgiving? How do we want to do Christmas? Um, try not to make a big decisions for a year after death or even big things. I know sometimes you have to move. You have to do these things to give everybody a chance to um, get used to what's going on. Be accepting of changes in the family and roles. Parent is gone. Maybe then it changes. One important thing to do is not to elevate one of the kids up to um, the, the level of adult. They had a client said that when his dad died, his mom said, well, you're the man of the family now. So instantly he went from, you know, like a tweener to being the man of the house and having to grow up. He lost some time there because he felt the necessity to grow up. Remember everyone's grief is unique. So, you know, kid A might behave this way, kid B might behave that way. Um, Remember that children are resilient. Yes, they are. They're very resilient with support. So that means you can't just say, oh, he's resilient. He'll get over it. You have to show them the support. You have to show them how to be resilient and be respectful of the differences in how someone grieves. Real quick, and then I'll go to questions, Jess. Um, this is our website. 
And if you go over to resources and down, you or it's over to more, I think. Anyways, it's a place where I have a lot of the stuff um, online. If you want to look up some of these materials or have them as handouts um, to get some reference from. Okay, thanks, Jess. Well, thank you, Jerry. I um, we had uh, a couple comments during, but I think the the, the one question that I think uh, was on my mind as well uh, is, you know, you talked about normal grief versus complicated grief, and uh, you know, uh, is there? Can you speak at all to like time frames? And I know that may be different based on circumstance, but is there a time frame at which you know um, what is normal? Maybe as you mentioned, in kind of the first month where someone may have a hard time getting out of bed versus when it when it becomes you know something that that is caused for uh you know a different level of intervention i would say look obviously look at their level of functioning and if they're still even just after a month if they're still just laying in bed and not doing anything if their functioning level is very low then that is time to have some intervention that is time maybe to go to a doctor or a psychiatrist obviously try to get them to go to some sort of therapy but I, I would I would only give it a month if somebody is really not doing well. After a month, you should be able to at least get up and, and do some of your day, you know, your activities of daily living. But some of those other uh, you know, uh, experiences like the the yearning or the loneliness um, that may take a lot longer and may persist, you know, on and off for a, you know, for a very long time, depending on the level of loss too. Right. That's a normal response. And you might yearn for that person. Um, for a long time and that doesn't mean it's complicated grief that just means that it is somebody that you miss but if you can still get up and do things and live then that's that's the criteria just like with the other um diagnoses we use right all right um i'm seeing so thanks for uh, uh, from another uh, participant, but I'm we are going to take a moment here and switch screens so that okay. uh, Jerry and I are, have been kind of controlling our own presentation. So just give me a moment here and we'll get you guys. Okay. All right. All right. Jerry, since you're still on, are you seeing my screen okay? Uh, yes, I am, ma'am. All right. All right. Well, again, I think, um, I, I, you know, it was important to us to be able to sh share a little bit with all of you guys about, uh, about the ex experience of grief prior to um, talking about resilience, because I think, it, you know, so much of the resilience literature is really around honoring these experiences we go through. And when we speak about challenging times, you know, just kind of going back to when Gosh, Dana and Ryan and, and myself, you know, started talking about doing this presentation last fall, you know, very much kind of still in the thick of, you know, as we still are kind of in the, you know, in, in the thick of, a, of the pandemic and with a lot of, you know, political woes and economic uncertainty. And, you know, I think today in particular, many of us are, are, are very heavy hearted with the news yesterday um, from coming out from Texas. You know, these are, we are facing our families more and more are facing challenging times. And again, I think we, we, we found ourselves saying, well, you know, all these, these techniques we use as, as, as therapists, as providers, as helpers, um, our cognitive behavioral, our dialectical behavioral, our family systems, they are very helpful, but they are also um, something that are, uh, that, 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 that sometimes feel like they, they fall short of really honoring some of these challenges. And, and with the, the shift in what we've seen, um, we wanted to make sure that we were also kind of coming with this resilience perspective. So um, you will absolutely, you will absolutely hear some of that, um, uh, you know, in this presentation. But again, uh, wanted to just kind of ground us in 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 in, in grief first, so that we kind of knew um, uh, that as a base before we get into resilience building. Um, so, you know, again, just kind of coupling on, on where, uh, where Jerry left off, that emotional pain, sadness, anxiety, um, these are normal when we've suffered major traumas, griefs, personal losses, or even when we hear of someone else's loss or trauma. And I think, you know, I, uh, it's so important to, to, to be aware of, of being able to validate and normalize those feelings. I think, unfortunately, in, in an attempt to protect our kids and our families, we have found ourselves kind of in a position where um, where sometimes our kids, you know, you know, don't feel like some of the spectrum of, of, of emotions are normal and they pathologize or relate to them in a way that they are something to be, to be rid of. 
Um, you know, I had a very a hard moment as a parent a, a couple months ago when my daughter who had had a rough day, you know, uh, you know, in a very emotional moment said that she was feeling had some feelings of, of, of you know, sadness and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and particularly literally we had had a day where she had felt a lot of boredom and kind of loneliness. Um, my daughter's an only child. So she said it was, you know, in a very dramatic way, she said for the first time in my entire, you know, 10 years of life, I felt today lonely and, and, and bored. And I thought and my response to her was, well, that's okay. And she looked at me like I was, you know, well, what do you mean? It's okay. It's okay to feel lonely and bored. And I was like, oh my gosh, I failed as a parent <laughs> you know, because it's so important to validate those emotions. And also to realize that that is a normal part of our experience. Um, you know, it is, it, it is okay to feel sad. It is okay to feel anxious. It's okay to feel lonely and bored. Um, but resilience is the ability to adapt well to adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of threats. And so we want to build these up in our family. We want to honor these experiences and give them the tools to feel like they can, they can keep going and, and, and to see kind of what, what's coming next in life. Um, so why, why today are our families experiencing, you know, maybe, you know, more challenges and, and, and maybe not, you know, this is my, my first go around, you know, being, a, you know, a, a middle-aged adult, I will often reflect on, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have a 95 year old grandma who, you know, does share her perspective sometimes and, and recognizing that, you know, certainly there are many other times in our history, but what is unique today? Well, today, I think many adults are working very extended schedules. They carry work pressures home with them, with us each night because we are always connected. Our kids can tend to be a bit overscheduled and buried in homework. There's a very performance-based, um, uh, we're in a very performance-based society. I've heard fifth graders talking about building their college resumes. Um, you know, these are things that definitely add stress to 21st century families. Um, and it makes building resilience even more important to help families manage stress and feelings of anxiety and, 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 and uncertainty. Um, so it's a critical life skill for kids and parents alike, alike and it can be learned, practiced, coached, and incorporated. Um, but here's the thing, it is best taught and it is best trained and coached when we are in these moments of challenge. Um, I often use a metaphor, uh, with families who are, or with, with individuals and families who are, who are, you know, practicing cognitive behavioral techniques to kind of change, to kind of rewire their brain. And one of the comments that comes up a lot is that it's really hard. It's hard to be mindful. It is hard to sit with anxiety. It is hard to function when I'm feeling depressed. And, and one of the things I'll talk about is if it's hard, it means you're working. If it's hard, it means you're building. And so the, the metaphor I use is often that one, the, the one of going to the gym. If you've ever worked out or challenged yourself to develop a new muscle, uh, you know, or a new set of muscles, um, you kind of know that unless you are straining that muscle and a little sore and, and pushing past your threshold, you're not probably getting stronger. So when we're in a gym setting, we kind of invite that stress on our bodies, knowing that it is part of the process. And yet I think as society, we have missed maybe the opportunity to also sit with our, as, as providers to sit with our families, as parents to sit with our kids during times where they are feeling emotional strain, where they're growing their emotional muscles and to say, to validate those hard feelings and to say that this is part of the work and that this is okay. So, you know, there's, yeah, I've borrowed from many, you know, you know, different authors or different, you know, kind of ways we can concept, conceptualize resilience, but this was a good one. I thought to kind of when we, when we conceptualize resilience with our families, we want to think about, um, you know, what do we, what do we really need? What are those domains, you know? Um, and one of those domains is having vision is having a shared for, for family. It's having a shared and understood sense of purpose, goals, and congruence. So as providers thinking about how can we make sure that when we have families coming in, maybe the grief and loss they're experiencing is the fact, or the challenge they're, they're experiencing is the fact that they have a child or an adolescent who is suffering from a mental health issue that they just never thought that they were gonna have to face or a co-occurring disorder or, 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 or suicidal behavior. So, you know, you know, getting our families to kind of sit together and, and to have vision about, you know, and, 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 and individually to have visions about, you know, where are we headed is really important. We need to have those emotion regulation. We have to have composure, the ability to regulate our emotion, to interpret bias and to call, be calm and in control. So here's, this is the good news here, you guys. This is where our CBT, DBT skills, you know, all that stuff that we've learned. Um, it's part of resilience work too. It is a part because if we don't know how to kind of manage and understand our emotions, then we are going to struggle to build resilience around them. Uh, 
we need to have reasoning, our ability to problem solve. We have to have resourcefulness to anticipate and plan. So as a provider thinking about where can I build this with, uh, with the families that I'm working with. Um, we need to ha take care of our health, have good nutrition and sleep. Um, we need to have tenacity or the ability to persist, uh, to have realistic optimism, to, 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 you know, to bounce back. We're gonna talk a lot about some of that in, in these upcoming slides. And um, we need to uh, have some collaboration, some support networks, some, some social context. I think this is where group work is one of the reasons why Jerry runs grief groups is because you know being able to come together and have other people who we can kind of share that perspective with, see people who are a couple of steps ahead of us, um, not necessarily, that's probably the wrong language to use, but people who are at different parts of their journey and kind of have to take some inspiration from that. Um, okay, so this, slide I just love, uh, I, or, or this concept I just love, but this is, uh, uh, I don't know if, if, if any of you are, are, are familiar with this Japanese art form, which I'm going to probably butcher, um, Kintsuji, I believe is the way you pronounce it, but this is basically a, the, the idea behind this piece, this art form is that when a piece of pottery or a piece of artwork breaks, uh, rather than um, throwing it away, uh, which typically is what I think in a lot of Western culture we would do, um, they mend it, but they mend it not just by trying to hide the imperfections and cracks, but really by highlighting them and, and with gold. Um, and once that broken piece of pottery is put back together in a way, uh, it, you know, it actually, the value of it, it, it increases. They, they consider those, they consider it to be stronger because they have mended all those, you know, you know, the, the, the breaks, you know, expose those areas where they were weak and we've been able to give time and attention to mend them together. We've highlighted them and are sh showcasing them, um, which, you know, it becomes part of the art. And I think, I, I love this as an idea of how we can look at ourselves, how we can look at, uh, at, at our families, that when something hard happens, um, the broken part is, is a very difficult thing to get through, but how we build that together and how we expose that or showcase that with others actually adds to our value. Um, and I've certainly seen this. And, you know, I, I think if all of you take a pause and kind of consider, you know, what is a time in your life where you have felt broken, where something in your life has felt like it, 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 it broke, it got messy. Um, and if you are, if you are fortunate enough to have some distance between that event and where you sit now, can you see how the way you mended it has made you stronger? How the way you mended it, you know, is it something you hide? Uh, is it something you have to hide? I mean, maybe we hide it, but maybe maybe we don't have to. Um, in showcasing our our hardships, you know, in what ways do we increase our value to the people around us? Um, and it's a, something to consider as providers too. You know, I, I always I feel very, um, you know, we have to be particular about when we maybe share certain parts of our life with our clients, depending on the the you know type of of work you do. But I think sometimes being able to share how you know, yeah, my, my life didn't go exactly perfectly or to plan either or hear something, you know, to, to be able to see that, you know, we can grow back stronger. All right. So um, uh, some of this information is coming from an article that I referenced at the bottom, um, but these are some concrete steps to building family resilience. Um, and uh, I kind of broke it down into, um, you know, three sort of different different frameworks. And this one is kind of you know, shifting the focus. So when we go through a challenging time, whether it is um, something we're experiencing as a result of what we're hearing on the news um, or something that we are going through uh, as, as individuals or as a family, one of the things we wanna do is shut down catastrophic thinking. And this can be tricky because we don't wanna shut down as Jerry said over and over again, we wanna validate hard, hard emotions, but catastrophic thinking um, is, is defined as a, as a style of thinking that leaves you unable to take purposeful action or to find a solution. And, and it creates anxiety, it does not create solutions. So, to, you know, it's important to discern between, you know, um, you know, sharing hard feelings and sharing catastrophic, catastrophic feelings. So hard feelings is, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to send my kid to school today, you know, knowing what happened yesterday. Um, I feel heavy and it was emotional and it was difficult to let them go. You know, um, catastrophic thinking is I can't work, think, or do anything while my kid is at school because I'm worried about something bad happening. Um, they're both valid. 
it, the catastrophic piece of that though is to really step back and say what are you care can you do about that you know and and if and if you can't there is something to you know and, and this is my, my my daughter who i'll probably bring up a few times during this presentation because she's a bit of a worrier and um you know uh one of the things that i i gave her that she she sleeps now under her pillow the first line of the serenity prayer uh god grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change um because she is someone who at nighttime wants to know you know, well, there's a storm. Is it going to be a tornado? Are we going to, are we, you know, are, are, you know, is my house safe? Is someone going to come kidnap me? You know, and, and, and I think like, you know, Jerry had mentioned it's at some point, I'm not going to say to her, I promise you, you will be safe tonight. You know, it, it's, it's what I want to do as a parent, but I also have to acknowledge that hard things happen and we can't always prevent them. Um, but how do we kind of ask for serenity in our heart to accept those things that we can't take action on? Um, another one is to create a strength, uh, 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 strengths family tree, or I think that might have maybe supposed to be family strengths tree, but either way, uh, I, you know, basically mining our strengths. What as a family do we do well? Um, and, you know, what do we do individually? What do we do as a family? And in the face of challenges, how do we leverage those strengths to figure out solutions? Um, you know, I recently did a team building exercise here with my front office here, here at work. And it's as uh, many of you who work in, in, in social services or in uh, mental health, you know, know it's been a hard years for us as providers as well. And my front office team tends to take the, the take a pretty good beating as we've had wait lists and things that, you know, throughout the year that have been, have been tough for them when what they want to do is help. So, you know, we talked about those hard times and validated those experiences as definitely being not the highlight of this year, but we also talked about what helped us to get through that, you know, and then they started talking about, you know, you know, when we started to be able to kind of do lunches together and to laugh together and to, you know, um, and to team, you know, having team meetings to problem solve. And so in the, in the discussion of what our challenges were, we talked about how did we get through that? Um, and that kind of also gave confidence in the fact that we can keep getting through because challenges will keep coming, you know, you know, I will, I will, I will definitely put myself in check when I kind of stop and say, okay, this year is going to be a, a calm, you know, calm and, 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 and plan, you know, a, a year that's going to go to plan because no year goes to plan, but how, how do we kind of take our past experiences and know that that's a roadmap for how we get through in the future. So this is another kind of change the focus. Um, yes, these challenges happen, but where, how can we focus on what we did to get through it instead of just kind of perseverating on what the hardship was and similarly grab, grab the good stuff. Um, we definitely as individuals have a negativity bias. This has been, uh, you know, I could spend a whole, a whole seminar talking about this, uh, this subject, the negativity bias. It is how human beings, we are, we are, we are wired from uh, survival, not mental health. And so uh, that negativity bias helps us to survive, but um, it does not help our mental health. And so confronting that bias, it, you know, means that when we go to the end of the day, I kind of think of it like a sand sifter, um, you know, if you were to take a typical sifter at the end of the day, and it, our minds are those sifters, what we're, the rocks we're gonna be left with in our sand sifter is gonna be the hard ones, the negative ones. Um, to purposefully bring in the positive is a good way to kind of balance and build resilience. That yes, today was a hard day and some really good things happened too. Um, and I just, I, some imagery here, because. There are a lot of words on these on these pages, but I wanted to kind of pause and think about that. You know, um, you know, all that. There are so many different ways we can kind of demonstrate resilience. And nature demonstrates resilience. I really like the the ones of like trees and plants growing out of the strangest places. Um, but again, you know, in what ways can you picture and change the focus on what resilience means? You know, is it about the weight we carry, or is it about the strength we feel when we have, you know, when we have accomplished something that seemed impossible? All right, so more on building family resilience. And now we're gonna shift a little bit to from change the focus to um, how do we take some action? Um, so as a family and, and as providers supporting families, how do we encourage positive risk-taking and discuss the lessons learned from failing? Um, when we overcome obstacles, failures, disappointments, it provide us, provides us a roadmap or a blueprint and the confidence for figuring out those bigger life challenges. Um, resilience, the hallmark of resilience is being able to pick ourselves up and, and course correct when things get tough. But if we don't choose paths, if we only choose paths, choose paths that have this, a sense of security, we don't, we don't really get the experience of knowing that like when things are hard, we can get through it. Um, I recently have a, had, have a, had a client had to come back after she had uh, done some anxiety work about five, six years ago. And she came back after four years of doing really, really well, she'd gotten hit by a horrific um, set of uh, of um, 
physical illnesses, all like infection, sinus infection, you know, uh, you just things that her body wasn't clearing herself. And so she went on a few different antibiotics and these course of antibiotics contributed to her um, basically developing really bad gastrointestinal issues that then cycled in and it, it threw, her, threw her entire central nervous system off to the point where she basically was not able to leave the house, was paralyzed with anxiety. She was already a very thin woman, had lost 15 pounds by the time she saw me. This started in October. By the time she saw me in December, she was in really, really bad shape. Uh, the combination of our work and then also working with the gastroenterologist to kind of find, you know, there definitely was some part of that that was uh, organic, it was biological with the, uh, the, the, the way that the antibiotics had, had affected her gastrointestinal system. We got her back on track um, and, uh, and she's working again and was doing really well. And then lo and behold, over the last six weeks, she has been hit by, I mean, her, her family, they, they got the flu, they've gotten COVID, they've gotten, I mean, they've been hit by, and, and for someone who just went through this really, really, really difficult illness, you know, and, and recovery, she was really paralyzed before she started all these sicknesses that, in, in the idea that what am I going to do if I get sick again? What, what if this happens to me again? Um, and so, you know, I have completely valid, I talked to her earlier this week and they're just now recovering from COVID. And I'm like, I, 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 I'm like, I can't even, part of me, I, I just empathize with the fact like, you know, for real, this happened again? Like, how, how are you guys having this kind of luck? But um, she, she, you know, she's not gotten as sick as she was. She's, you know, you know in recovery right now, her, her fear is that for six weeks, she has been basically uh, you know, ha had to take a step back from her life again because of physically being sick and how am I going to get back on track? And what we really leaned into this week was you did it, you did it four months ago, you know, back in January and February, when you went from being unable to do anything to back to work and living your life, you did this, you can do it again. So as much as I would have loved for her not to like go through this last six weeks, you know, these experiences she had is also how she's going to have confidence that she's, she can get back on track. Um, Part of taking action is also, again, balancing that positivity and rejuvenating. And I think this is really hard. I think of some of you who work in more intensive treatments and you're working with families who uh, are, you know, their entire focus is on, um, is on, on their crisis mode that they're in. How do I, how do we, you know, how, how do we kind of get through this? And you have parents who are maybe, you know, driving their kids back and forth to programming and kids who are just trying to, I mean, they're just trying to keep afloat um, and, 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 and tread water. And, you know, here I have a, a, you know, a slide about, you know, going to the spa. <laughs> um, I, I recognize that, that this is hard, but it's so important to remind families that caring for self and taking that time to build positive family time together, you know, it, it, it needs to occur side by side with the hard work, you know, and, uh, and, and I think that that is also how yeah, it is a way we balance and take action. So it's a fun way we take action. So this felt like a good time to kind of put in my little slide on kind of hijacking uh, some of our, or hacking some of our happiness chemicals. Uh, because when we think about things we can do to take action, um, we, are, we are capable of not just um, changing a focus or, or building resilience, but actually like changing our biochemistry. Uh, we know the dopamine, which is, uh, you know, our, our pleasure seeking uh, chemical in our body, uh, will will increase, for example, as a result of things like using drugs or alcohol. Uh, it will, dopamine will, will attract to addictive behaviors, but it also uh, can increase in, as a result of anything that we do that allows us, to, that makes us feel like we're completing a task. Dopamine increases when we do self-care. It increases when we exercise or listen to music. So we can basically induce a feeling of reward um, within families by engaging in some of these activities that really increases that level of dopamine in their body. Um, oxytocin is, well, you know, I'm going to go to serotonin first because we'll stick with the, we'll stick with the, the, oop, there we go, with the neuro, the neurotransmitters. So serotonin is our mood stabilizer. Um, when we know we're going through challenging times, having that stability of mood is really important. It's not going to prevent us from feeling sad. It's not supposed to. Uh, but what it does do is it allows us to feel sad. And then, you know, as Jerry was talking earlier about the, 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 the preschool age child who may one moment be crying and the next minute be playing, you know, um, serotonin allows us to do that. It allows, you know, when we're grieving to, you know, to connect with, with grief and then to later on still want to go out and plant my garden. Um, and there are ways of increasing serotonin. Um, meditation is a, is a big one. Um, Deep breathing increases serotonin. Exercise, uh, such as running, our sun exposure increases levels of vitamin D, 
which also increases serotonin. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, certain foods like oatmeal and bananas uh, will also increase serotonin. So there are others, but I really wanted to highlight that that is a, um, an opportunity uh, there as well. Um, oxytocin, I don't know how many of you have heard of oxytocin, um, our cuddle, I like to call it the cuddle hormone. Uh, the way I introduce oxytocin to clients is I kind of, I let them know, I said, well, you know, our, our body has these stress hormones and one is cortisol. Cortisol is a really important stress hormone in short doses. It makes us focused. It makes us, uh, you know, able to take quick action. Um, and, and, and it, it, you know, we, again, need it for survival. We're not meant to have chronically high amounts of cortisol in our bodies. Cortisol over time in chronically high amounts will leave us depleted, our immune system down, stressed. Um, luckily, cortisol has this sort of kryptonite um, alternative other hormone, which is oxytocin. And oxytocin, you know, again, we call the love or the contentment hormone. It happens when two people are connecting. Um, it happens during um, physical intimacy. It happens though also during, uh, you know, just, just healthy relationships and connecting. It'll help when it'll, it'll uh, occur when we play with our pets. Um, when we are helping someone else, we, there's, I, I love it because we get the double benefit. When you reach out and support someone else, they get oxytocin increases, you get oxytocin increases. So even when we're going through challenging times, it is a great time to think about how can I support others? Um, I'm in, uh, in uh, at, at, at the church I belong to, I'm in a ministry uh, called I Care, and we have allies that are not therapists. Um, I'm a coach for them, but they go out and support other members of the community. And when we meet monthly, it's very apparent to me that our I Care allies, the ones who are supporting the recipients of the service, are also experiencing hardship in their own lives. But inevitably, when we sit down and talk about the help we are, we are providing in our, in our, you know, our, our spiritual community, it is also help for them. So it's just a great experience of how oxytocin can be induced. Um, and then endorphins. So our endorphins are, um, are typically, uh, you know, uh, you know they, they, they reduce pain. So when we think about, again, grief and challenging times, we have, we have neurotransmitters that can increase our, our motivation, our reward, stabilize our mood, and to help us to manage pain. Um, and so laughing, dancing, um, actually just the facial expressions of smiling, is something that will induce endorphins, even if you're not feeling happy in that moment. That's a kind of a cool thing. We, you know, just putting a smile on your face will actually release endorphins. Also dark chocolate will, <laughs> um, certain smells, meditation. So uh, there are ways we can kind of help our families hack their, hack their biochemistry to, uh, to, to feel better and to take action. But back to resilience. Um, and so our, 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 our final kind of uh, two, from uh, at least from 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 this chapter uh, or, or from this particular article was around nurturing connection. So you know we've talked about changing focus, we've talked about taking action. Now we're talking about our connections. So um, you know for families, coaching them on how to be there when things are going right. Uh, how we respond to someone's good news actually does more for building a relationship than how we respond to the bad news. So how can you encourage families that you're working with to practice and encourage active constructive responding not only with family members but also with their friends and this is something that for our teens and, and actually all of us can be kind of tricky you know i uh, there is you know sometimes when someone shares good news um we get excited about it in our response especially if we're you know a teenager still developing these skills might be oh my gosh something good happened to me too um and while that's not a terrible way to respond I think we have to be aware of sometimes that like that may actually kind of take the attention away from something else or from that other person's good news. So if any of you've ever been on the other side of a conversation like that, where you shared something good and the response was someone else sharing their good news back, you're, you're glad to share in it, but you also kind of feel a little bit like, well, okay, but you know, like this is something I was really excited about. So even teaching our teams, um, our, our families, like how to how to just be present, you know, the best way to kind of receive good news is to just sit in it, you know, and, 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 and share your good news for later on. Um, allow family members to replicate successes. So uh, when you notice someone doing something well, name the specific strategy, skill, and effort that led to the good outcome. So, you know, there's, this is kind of the difference between, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, you did a, you know, you, you know, you, you did a great job out on the field today or, 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 or great job out there today or good win 
versus, you know, I noticed how well you were defending your specific position and how I, I saw you cheering on your teammates. And I saw that even when you were tired, you persisted. Like by really digging in and labeling, um, that really allows someone to walk away with resilience building skills. So um, quick anecdote about this one, again, again, with my, my, my lovely, my daughter, um, we were uh, playing a, a, you know, a, a family game the other night and, uh, you know, uh, and she, it's a game where it, it, it's competitive and it's kind of, you know, she was kind of alone against my husband and I, for her choice, she wanted it to be that way. It's called a game called Hero Quest, where she was running the monsters and the game board and we were the heroes. So we were kind of, as we should have been ganging up against her and it kind of, uh, you know, went from feeling really good to like having her, she started getting, kind of getting pouty. She didn't like that she was getting ganged up upon. Um, and then, you know, we offered her the opportunity to maybe shift games. Uh, she, uh, you know, struggled, but then did so and then wasn't enjoying the next game. And about half an hour after we ended up not playing the game anymore and just kind of, you know, calling our game night because it wasn't becoming fun for anyone. Um, she came back to me and said, you know, mom, I think I think I really feel like I, I just maybe needed some alone time. And I, I wanted to play the family game, but I, I kind of just needed some recharge time. And I feel really bad because, you know, we ended the game night in a, in a not so great way. Um, so when we talked about it after, you know, we talked about how maybe she could have handled that differently during the, uh, you know, during the game itself and kind of coached her on that to which she felt even worse because she missed this opportunity. And so, you know, after kind of, you know, having a little bit of a resilience discussion, hey, mistakes is how we come back and it's how we, you know, it's, it's how we build new skills. We also talked about like, let's talk about what you did well after this, because six months ago, you know, the same kid would have, you know, had a 45 minute meltdown and really struggled to recover from it. You came back, you did whatever you did for 20 minutes in your room. You came back and you were able to share those experiences. So by really labeling what she did well in that moment and identifying specific strategies for how maybe we could have done that even more effectively in the future, that becomes that what really wasn't like the best experience in terms of a family game night became a good experience for building new skills and resilience. Um, so again, when we're considering our role as providers, as helpers, as, uh, as, as therapists, potentially, um, we, we, you know, this uh, slide, just another helpful one to kind of think about how do we wrap around our families. We want to encourage family togetherness, coordinate a safety net of services, um, look at strength-based programs, not just problem-based, look at what families have in terms of community connections, and then also really support engaged parents. So kind of going back to FRC and what they do really well, uh, you know, versus I know a lot of our other or, or some other um, intensive programs is I think a lot of these pieces, but by engaging parents, um, by the coordination that they do and by developing family, that, that together family time, I think, you know, in addition to, you know, building those community connections and strength-based programming, really wrapping around a family is gonna help that individual a lot more. We can't really treat a person in isolation and we can't really build resilience in isolation. We can, but we're gonna not have as much success. Kind of another model here, um, you know, is that uh, when we think about family resilience, one of the best ways we can help them is by helping families to identify what their shared beliefs are to help them find meaning together. Um, so is that spirituality? Are those family values? So these can be some good strategies to come up with in family sessions is to kind of come together and, and to figure out what are our shared beliefs and, and focus and values as a family. Um, what is the structure? What does it look like in terms of our level of, of you know, of, of connectedness? Are we a flexible system? Um, are we a very, you know, you know, do we have enough stability in our system? So looking for opportunities to create, um, to, to, to create family networks, but also to kind of think about how a family is organized. So again, here, as I said, you know, family resilience, and this is, we're not introducing all new topics. This is ways in which your family systems work can really help to also build resilience. Um, and then also kind of our communication pieces, um, you know, uh, you know, leaning into my DBT uh, skills here, but you know, what interpersonal effectiveness skills are going to help in terms of allowing families to not only address hardships difficulty, to allow emotions, to validate emotions when they're being expressed freely um, and, and to have a, you know, a collaborative spirit when it comes to problem solving. And we're gonna get into kind of those direct approaches next, but I wanted to just share this slide in case this is something that this one might be a good one to kind of like blow up and print. Um, and it is not mine, it's from the, uh, the Walsh Family Resist, uh, Resilience Framework as I referenced at the bottom. Um, 
this is going to feel a little familiar from Jerry's presentation, which is good because we need to kind of, you know, talk about, you know, we need to, you know, it, it, uh, to remember that, you know, when we're building resilience, what are some of those important skills, um, you know, allowing people to talk, 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 just allowing, this is not us as supporters, talk, talk, talking, this is allowing our families or our adolescents, um, our kids, uh, our individual clients to talk and just express express what they're feeling without judgment and with valid, with uh, with feelings of being validated. Um, so then it becomes our role to listen, listen, listen. Um, we want to allow ourselves to learn and fail. We don't build resilience and grow until we have struggled. And this is huge for our kids and our teens who are growing up in a society where they worry that a failure means a mark on their record, which will mean that they won't have the life they wanted. You know. Um, this is where um, parents may choose or, or even us as counselor may choose to kind of express our own failures. When my daughter was going through that hard night the other night and started to feel really bad that she didn't express herself right in the moment, you know, the first thing I did was say, kiddo, I do this every day. You know, I counsel people every day and I think later on about like, oh, I wish I would have said that differently or I have an interaction with someone or even my parenting. I actually leaned into a time where I said, you know, the other night you know, I was frustrated and I could tell you were emotional and I totally reacted to you. And later on, I thought well, that wasn't helpful. Like, that's not how I wanted to react. It's okay. It's okay to struggle. Um, when we can reflect on it is when we build. So, uh, you know, this one's really important is teaching problem solving versus giving the answers. And so I think this is as important for us as therapists as it is to coach our parents on, uh, the parents of, of in, in families we're working with. Um, when a kid, when our kids come to us or when our clients come to us and they don't know what to do, you know, we need to resist the urge of saying, well, my advice is this, this, and this. Uh, instead, we want to kind of say, well, what problem solving skills can we employ to figure this out? You know, do we want to weigh uh, the pros and cons? Do we want to consider our, um, you know, you know, can, do we want to kind of consider some consequences to each action? Do we want to, you know, you know, you know, and I, again, I, the whole other presentation to talk about teaching problem solving, but, but, but point here is let's, you know, focus on that versus giving the answers and helping parents to do that too. That's where resilience is built. Um, helping to identify emotions. So, you know, this is one that I think it's missed sometimes is just when we see that someone is struggling, you know, not assuming we know what that emotion is. Uh, you know, this morning I walked into my office and I, you know, noticed that my front office person was, was, you know, she had just hung up a call that she said was, you know, a, it was a woman who was intoxicated and it was a tough call. And I, I, and I said, I, and, and I kind of just noted something on her face. I said, are you doing okay? And she said, no, I'm not. And, um, and I said, okay. I said, well, you know, it, was it this call? So there's me kind of assuming like you just had a tough call. You must be upset about that call. And she said, my heart's just really heavy. And then she was able to talk about the fact that she, like many of us, had a real tough time dropping her little ones off to school today. She's a, a teacher in training. And so, you know, just pausing and asking, like, what emotion are you feeling can often let someone just kind of experience that in that moment. And we don't have to have those answers. Um, acknowledge mistakes, you know, teaching that, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's about acknowledging our mistakes, going back to our J Japanese art form, you know, maybe even we paint in gold our mistakes because it's our mistakes that made us learn. Um, and then of course we need to develop coping skills. We need to be able to get through hard things. And that's where so many of the skills you guys are already teaching is important. And then modeling self-care um, ourselves, uh, both um, both as providers, as well as uh, as, as for parents. Um, it's always funny to me when my, my clients, um, I, I had the experience this past couple of weeks where I, I have a vacation coming up in two weeks and uh, a couple of my clients noted that I hadn't taken a vacation in like the last two years, really. And I was, you know, they were kind of not calling me out, but like everyone was, we're really glad you're taking a trip, you know? So just knowing, you know, as a therapist, I feel kind of guilty sometimes. I'm taking a whole week off. I have people I see every week. How is that going to, you know, by modeling that like, yeah, I need breaks too, to be fresh for you. And I know I have a team that can support parents need to do that as well. So that's, again, you know, I know you have a million places to be and you're taking care of your families but how can you take care of yourself? Um, as Jerry had mentioned, we're gonna quickly go through just some slides on some, some various resilience building for different age groups. Um, and a lot of this is overlapping, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on these. I also intentionally put a little bit more text on these pages so that you'd have them as reminders, but um, we'll quickly go through that, you know, very young children might not be able to express anxieties and fears. Uh, so, you know, but but they do absorb frightening events from the news or from conversations that they overhear. So keeping in mind that like, 
you know, as I think Jerry had a slide that said a child old enough to love is, you know, is old enough to grieve. Um, they may not be able to express it, but they're feeling it. So that's just more of a, like, bear in mind that um, they pick up a lot. Uh, watch for our children for, for signs of fear and sadness that they may not be able to put into words. As they have they become extra clingy, need more hugs. Um, have they, you know, started old habits again after we thought they'd outgrown the behavior? Are they suddenly more irritable? Um, I think the biggest one about younger children and pre preschool children is that most of what they do is through play. So as parents, you know, again, this pause to just, you know, sit and draw some art with our kids. You, they, you don't need to interpret their art. In fact, please don't, you know, uh, let them tell you about it. Um, let them play those things out if they can. Um, I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, my daughter who has some, had had some school anxiety as a kid, she wanted to play out first day of school well into her fourth grade, you know, and, and every time we play, I would be the kid and she would be the parent slash the teacher. And I would need to wake up clingy and anxious and then go through the motions. Now, you know, I, again, this was a pretty obvious way that she was playing something out. But, you know, if I had, you know, in, in a good intention, wanted to talk to her about her insecurities and, and felt like that was going to take the place of playing out, um, I probably would have missed an opportunity. Use family time like a security blanket for our kids. You know, we want to wrap them up in closeness, make sure that they have lots of family time. Again, this is where 21st century families have a, have have some challenges. So I think quality versus quantity in a lot of cases. Um, you know, can we have some phone free times? You know, especially for parents. You know, where we just commit to not to to being present. Is it that family dinner? We don't have to have three hours a day of togetherness to let our kids feel secure, but we do need to have some very intentional time and coaching that is important. For our elementary school children, um, their, their new friend groups um, and new activities is kind of what's starting to make them feel like they have their own identity. So as they're doing this, we also want to make sure that they have a place where they can feel safe in our, in our, in our home. So balancing out all this newness that they're experiencing with the security of home. Uh, you know, this is the age where we do start to use language to talk things through. Uh, and so much of this mimics exactly what Jerry had talked about. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but basically be honest, uh, be honest with our kids um, and, uh, uh, and validate them. And when there's a situation outside of the home that's frightening, you know, we do probably want to limit amount of the amount of news our children watch or listen to. So this balances out that honesty with the fact that, um, you know, Honest conversations with us, you know, as parents or as, as providers is going to be, we get to control the delivery uh, when their exposure is to news sources. Maybe we are watching the news nonstop even because we're absorbed in it. It's also really important to, to understand that like that's probably not the best way for them to process that information. Um, be aware too that like with, you know, I, 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 I plug here for, you know, monitoring technology. Um, it's so easy to find these things on technology and not often in the delivery we want. So just, you know, you know, just be aware of that, that our kids, when they're spending time alone with their devices, um, just to monitor kind of what they're doing, because it may be getting exposure to things in a way that you, we don't want them to. Realize that extra stressors uh, may heighten normal daily stresses. So, um, you know, and again, here I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about our, our kids and our teens that come to therapy or come to treatment and families who are focused on, we often focus on the behavior. What, you know, what is going on that is causing, uh, you know, ca causing Johnny to deescalate in this way and become aggressive in the home. And so we, we formulate a plan around the aggression, the behavior. Um, and not that that's altogether problematic, but I think we always want to be aware of, and, and you know, labeling what are those emotions that are also underlying that. Um, so, you know, think of our delivery, the consequences may still be there, you know, that, that if we've destroyed something in the house, there will still be some consequences for that, but can we also make space for what emotions, what might be going on and, 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 and approach our kids when I lean into my, my, my IFS folks, our internal family systems, but when we have a part of us that, you know, that, that acts out in that way, in spite of kind of knowing better or learning better, be curious, curious and compassionate with, with ourselves and with our clients when, and, and, and parents with our kids about, you know, you know, it, that, that is unusual. It's been a long time since we've had an outburst like that. Like, I'm curious as to what might have been going on that day that like, you know, brought that up. Um, and, and treating that compassionately that, you know, although, although the behavior itself wasn't acceptable, I, I do, I do understand that there was a lot more going on there for you. And I, I, you know, maybe we could talk about how next time, you know, we could address that differently. So we don't, you know, so we don't have the, the you know, this end result. 
Um, pause, pause for a moment of family time. Uh, no, just, uh, you know, again, just kind of that idea of wrapping our families in family time and kind of staying connected and in nature. All right, middle school kids. Um, even without larger uh, traumas, middle school can be an extra difficult time for many children as they struggle to meet academic demands, avoid new social pitfalls. So just knowing that this is a typically volatile time, I'm probably, if any of you work with adolescents, I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, uh, that middle school can be a tumultuous time. So when you happen to layer middle school with challenges, life challenges, um, you know, big ones like, like, like death or like, uh, you know, a pandemic or like, you know, uh, you know, a big change in the family system. Um, it's adding to that stress and pressure. And I think our, just knowing our kids are vulnerable at that time. So it's a time we want to reinforce empathy and help our, our child keep, keep perspective. So we want to balance their, what they're going through with the fact that they also are, um, that they are feeling, uh, to keep a perspective with also what's going on in the world. And I'm, I'm thinking about Jerry's, um, uh, uh, your, uh, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm losing the word, but your teen, that, that teen code and the idea of like, don't, basically don't minimize my concerns. You don't wanna, you know, you don't wanna say, well, I know today was a really hard day and your friends all left you out, but you know, in, you know, in such and such country, you know, you know, this is going on. And can you imagine being like, that's not about, that's not about keeping in perspective. I think we want to keep perspective by saying, you know, how, how you would use this, uh, I think this technique in that situation might be to, uh, you know, man, I, 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 it, I, that must have been really, really hard to be left out by your friends all day. Like I, you know, I, that, that really makes it hard to focus and to do other things. It totally makes sense why you're not in a great mood right now. Um, you know, I, you know, it, 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 I, I wonder what might've been going on with those friends that they would treat you like that. Cause that's really unusual. So there's that, that empathy piece, like they might've been going through something too. It may not just be about them. The perspective piece may be, you know, instead of talking about, you know, kids in other countries who have a lot more, you know, or other, other circumstances who have a lot more that they're going through compared to one of their own circumstances, you know, you know, I remember last year you went through a time like that. And I also, you know, what I, I, I remember some of those friendships, while maybe one or two of those like didn't end up coming back, like you built other stronger friendships after that. So, you know, I think it's just important to know that like, while it's really hard now, it probably won't be forever, right? That's also that decatastrophizing. De de um, help them see beyond the current situation. Kind of just went through that. Uh, talk with your child about their your, your own feelings during times of extraordinary stress. So this one be careful of, right? Like this is not to say, you know, um, you know, when your kids are saying, I'm, I'm worried about going to school today saying, you know what, I'm scared too. Like, this is the scariest thing. And, and I'm, I am like, this is going to be the hardest day for me to send you to school after the news yesterday. That may be true. Um, but I think we want to be careful about not just doubling down on our kids' emotions and instead suggesting that, you know, yeah, I, I really feel that hardness too. And, and one of the things, you know, even that, what I might say is, you know, even though my rational mind knows that, that even with what happened yesterday, schools are still the safest, one of the safest places we could possibly be. It's really hard when you hear that news not to think about that. So it makes sense that we feel uneasy today. So you hear the subtle difference. And I think coaching families on how to do that is really important. Um, and share the ways how you cope and what's helpful to you. Um, while also exploring what might benefit a, ch a child. So this is one to feel free to like, you know, pass on to families. Um, again, I, refer I have a reference at the bottom if you want to look at a larger article on this topic. Um, but one important thing to, you know, just to kind of reinforce for our families and for our kids is that our resilience is a muscle and with focus and time, it will become stronger. So it is not, it's not something we build overnight. It, it, you know, it's something that we practice over and over and over again, and it is okay to struggle and to know better and then to continue to struggle. Um, that that struggle is how we are getting stronger for my earlier metaphor of the gym. Um, Lastly, just with high schoolers, uh, again, you know, during our teen years, emotions may be volatile. We want to find the best way to connect with our teens. Um, talk when we can, even if we don't feel like they want to talk. You know, uh, again, we want to respect their space, but we also recognize that sometimes, uh, you know, creating that space between the two of us might be important. So if a, if a parent comes in and says, "Well, my kid doesn't ever want to talk to me," you know, one of the suggestions I have is like, "Well, you know." Yeah, sitting down across the table from each other or even on the couch together may not be that time, but will what about when they're driving with you, you know, when you're sitting side by side then? 
uh, what about when, uh, you, you know, uh, you know, when you're, you know, would they be willing to come take a walk with you, engage in another activity, you know, like this is where we can take family time and create those opportunities for discussion as well. Make sure your teen has a place uh, to, you know, to, 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 has a safe place. I think this is, can be tricky. I hear a lot of parents who, one of the consequences for their kids, especially when they're engaging in unsafe behaviors, is to remove a door um, or to kind of, you know, and, and I'm not saying that that is a, by any means a terrible um, intervention. I think there is a time and place for almost all interventions, but just know that when we use an inter intervention like that, that, that completely decreases a, a place of safety for our teens, it can also escalate how they, their, their, their lack of, of, of feeling safety. And so just being mindful of that and maybe creating alternatives to still have some safety and privacy when we know that, that for teens, those, those two things are very connected. Um, no, they may prefer to be with their friends, um, but be, be ready to provide that family time when they need it and set aside that time that includes their friends. So uh, this is sometimes where, you know, as much as we want to kind of going back to that picture of the two parents and the, uh, this one, you know, um, you know, I, while that may feel like the ideal of what a family time might look like, you know, it's okay to have that and to have each of those kids have a friend along with if they're in that place where um, they're more likely to, to, uh, to engage. So um, friends become family at this age. Um, encourage them to take news breaks and social media breaks. Um, ask about what they're seeing, use it as a catalyst for discussion, ask their opinions about what's happening and listen to their answers. Have honest discussions of your fears and expectations and that can help our high schoolers learn to express theirs. Um, again, being careful not to, you know, exacerbate them by kind of, you know, sharing all of our fears, but, but, but doing so in a purposeful way as parents um, or even as providers. We can also encourage them to use journaling or express emo to express emotions. Um, and lastly, keeping in mind that most teens are already feeling extreme highs and lows just because of their hormone levels in their bodies. So added stress or trauma can make these shifts seem more extreme. Be understanding of these feelings and emotions, but also be firm when they need to, or when they respond to stress with angry or sullen behaviors. So in this case, we're validating the emotion and right, here's our DBT skills. Like, you know, it makes sense that you are feeling the way you are feeling. And the way you're speaking to me isn't part of our family values or it isn't acceptable. So we need to find some different strategies. Um, again, just kind of another, this family wellness project had some really good tips. Uh, some of these we really already went over, but I like, I like having these kind of standalone slides, um, you know, a couple on here that, you know, we, we, we didn't necessarily, you know, go through uh, was the use of humor. Um, I think that's, you know, needless, you know, being able to still laugh. Uh, my, uh, I remember when I was young, my, uh, I, I have a sister who's two years younger than me, but definitely took the typical role of, of, of second in command. And she, she was the risk taker in our family and she was in trouble for something that she did. And she got grounded for two weeks. And I remember for the first day or two, she just kind of avoided my parents and sulked around the house. And my dad finally came to her and said, you know, you're stuck with us for two weeks. So like, just know, like we're, we have no intention to like be angry at you or not. Like the consequence is the consequence. They end up building Adirondack chairs and laughing their butts off. And I think they still, my dad and my sister still reflect on that as being one of like the highlights of their relationship. And it came during the time when they were, uh, when she was restricted and 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 presumed, presumed she was in trouble. So um, I'll leave that one there. Um, Okay, here's another just kind of uh, when we are working with families, um, you can ask your clients these questions to build a growth mindset. So here's just some, some takeaways to keep in mind that as we're processing uh, tough situations with our families, if we're looking at a resilience or growth mindset lens, we want to ask, how did you keep things going when things got tough, right? So my client who uh, has been sick for the last six weeks you know, we could focus on just how unfair life is and how scared she is about what's going to happen next, but also like, what did you, what did you do to get through it? Um, what happened today that helped you keep going? Uh, what will you do to solve this problem? So it's questions versus, you know, suggestions. Um, are you proud of the end result? Why or why not? So when something did happen and you, you know, what, you know, what about it, you know, what, what about it, you know, are, are you happy with how things ended up? And then more importantly, probably with this question is, what led to you know the end result being a positive one? What did you do today that uh, that uh, what did you do today that made you try hard? So um, what did you kind of encourage yourself with? Where is that intrinsic motivation um, from a hard experience? What did we learn from this? Um, 
How have you prepared yourself? What strategies did you use? What mistakes did you use that taught you? Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a, the I, I, I'm having to move around screens here. So um, that taught you something, there we go. Um, so I think that is the end of my formal presentation. Um, I borrowed one of Jerry's, uh, Jerry's little pictures here uh, that it's easier to build stronger children than to repair broken men and women. Um, so I think again, just highlighting the fact that for our families that, you know, it's okay for our kids to struggle. It's okay for our families to struggle and for them to see struggles when we get to the point of, um, a, 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 you know, adulthood will have already done some of that resilience work. And that is, that is really, you know, as much of a privilege as it is, you know, the hardship that we went through. All right. All right, Jess, you did a great job because everybody understood it and there are no questions right now, unless somebody wants to pipe in with a question. Yes, by all means. Sorry, Dana. Dana. <laughs> yeah. Dana and Ryan, any kind of last thoughts here? We're uh we're on time at least. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you guys so much. And um, there is just in the question uh, category, it's not a question, but just some resources specific to Chicago, which is the grief, trauma, over shootings and violence. Um, well, so yeah. they were going to be saying, actually, he's still on. Um, but yes, if there's any specific resources for that. Okay, and I see Matt here said he had a question. Yeah, I'm asking him to tell us, ask the question. Okay. okay. I believe, yeah, I think that's what he's referring okay. to. Just referring okay. to the resources. Sure okay. Yes, no, I, pre I appreciate that. A few of you guys chimed in with, again, I know we're speaking to a, uh, you know, a, 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 a panel full of other people who kind of do this work already. So I, I appreciate the time just to kind of sit and reflect on on uh, to, to, to reflect on the work we do. If anyone else has other tips that they'd like to share, by all means, we have a couple minutes here, but. Um, appreciated what people put in the chat as well. Mostly people are just saying thank you, Jessica. All right. Well, thank you guys. Obviously, as uh, we have mentioned and talked about, uh, very timely and I think uh, very helpful in supporting not only our clients, but supporting ourselves, right? As parents, as colleagues, as just humans. So thank you again to BZA um, and to everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care.